to another colourful and entertaining Live at Three with Derek and Thelma coming up on the hour. But before that, the style of painting by James Arthur O'Connor is examined in the eye of the artist. Anytime that I have occasion to go into the Irish room here at the National Gallery of Ireland, even if I'm only passing through, I'll always pause, if just for a moment, to take another look at The Poachers by James Arthur O'Connor. Hollywood at its most extravagant couldn't improve on that for a backdrop. To tell us something about the work of this remarkable Irish artist, here's John Hutchinson. James Arthur O'Connor is one of the best known of early Irish 19th century landscape painters. And this picture here, Homeward Bound, is the sort of painting which I think most people associate with his work. In the center of the picture, you have a man wearing a red waistcoat, walking down a lane on a summer's day with his dog. And this really, as I say, is what most people think of when they think of the painter O'Connor. The style of the painting is not really very original, because it's based on ideas and techniques that were developed in the 17th century by an artist called Claude Lorraine. And Claude's idealized pastoral landscapes were very popular, both in Ireland and in England in the 18th century. And his technique, his way of composing pictures, was developed and copied by artists in these islands. In the foreground, you have some rocks defining the very front of the picture. Then, in the middle, you have the figure and the dog and a couple of oak trees. Again, very typical of O'Connor's middle period work. And the eye is led into the distance towards the blue light hills by means of a zigzagging path. O'Connor's earliest pictures, unlike Homeward Bound, are quite topographical. In other words, they're precise views. They're not generalized. They're not picturesque like Homeward Bound. And this picture we have in front of us here is one of a series of four painted in Ballinrobe in County Mayo about 1818, in other words, some six or eight years before Homeward Bound. The four that are in the National Gallery are of Ballinrobe House, one of the mill, one of the pleasure grounds, and one of Loch Mask nearby. This is the picture of the pleasure grounds. O'Connor's way of handling paint is really quite different from the technique that he used in Homeward Bound. It's much more precise, and he's concerned here with showing the details in the picture. And although he takes the pains to point out every sort of foliage, for example, in the trees, he nonetheless, and this is typical of O'Connor, he nonetheless insists on swathing the whole scene in very atmospheric forms of light. And this is something which continues right throughout his career. Courtney Kenny was a rich miller who commissioned O'Connor to paint the four pictures for him. And this is a second picture in the Ballin Robe series, and it shows in the very center of the picture, Ballinrobe House itself, which of course was the pride and joy of Courtney Kenny. And in fact, in the foreground of the painting here, you can see two men, I think just ordinary laborers, one of them turning towards the house and the industrial buildings in the distance, admiring their importance, which of course is what the artist was supposed to develop and stress in the first place. This form of topographical landscape painting by O'Connor is really the tail end of a tradition which started in Ireland with artists like William Ashford and Thomas Roberts. After the Act of Union in 1801, patronage of this kind died off really very quickly. And O'Connor was left with a choice to make. And this was, he's not alone in this. Because as the middle classes began to buy more paintings, so the sort of paintings which sold had to reflect their taste. They were looking for pleasant little cabinet pictures of landscapes which were picturesque, which made very little demands on the imagination. And this was the sort of style which O'Connor and his peers, both in Ireland and in fact in England, decided to try and develop. O'Connor visited London once in 1813 with his friends Francis Danby and George Petrie. But he only spent a few months in England and returned shortly afterwards to look after his orphan sisters. And then, of course, he developed his own career in Ireland for a few years. But about the age of 30, in 1821, he finally decided to go to England to try and make a living there, because there wasn't much work for him in Ireland at all. And when he arrived in England, 
he fell into the style of landscape painting which was quite current at the period. A large number of English 19th century artists were influenced by Dutch landscape painting. One of O'Connor's great contemporaries, Constable, was also influenced by Dutch painting, at least to some extent. And he very certainly looked at the works of Gainsborough, the early landscapes of Gainsborough, which show, rather like this picture here, the influence of 17th century Dutch landscape painting, particularly, in this case, in the sandbanks, which is a motif which artists like Weinartz, for example, use frequently in Holland in the 17th century. By 1829, it was fairly obvious that O'Connor wasn't going to make a big success of his career, because in that year, he, we know that he sold off a large number of his paintings at auction. And curiously enough, by about 1830, a year later, it seems that O'Connor was really becoming quite unhappy with the way his life was progressing. We know by do from documentary evidence that he was missing what he called the wild and beautiful scenery of Ireland. And because his work wasn't progressing very well from a commercial point of view, he seems to have decided to make a few changes in his style. And the changes that were made are really quite strong because from, let's say, 1830 to 1835, his paintings as a whole became dark, gloomy, and really quite melancholy. In other words, they were romantic pictures, no longer picturesque, idealized rural scenes, such as we saw throughout the 20s. They become introverted, and they tell us more about the artist's own feelings about his response to life as opposed to the landscape, and about the conventions of romanticism than they tell us about particular landscapes. For example, this picture here, which is called The Frightened Wagoner, is very much a romantic picture. Its roots are definitely in the 18th century, rather like the topographical works he did are also rooted in the 18th century. But here you find O'Connor developing the ideas of what was known as sublime landscape painting. Sublime landscape was the sort of landscape which, in the 18th century, was supposed to inspire a sort of pleasurable terror in the viewer or spectator. Now, sublime motifs, sublime ideas, which O'Connor develops here, can be seen really quite clearly in, for example, the bolt of lightning, which reaches down from the top right-hand corner towards the wagoner, in the windswept trees, and in the rushing waterfall, and in fact, the whole dark, gloomy, foreboding air of the picture. But O'Connor has developed the sublime to something quite different, something really romantic. And the way he does this is by inviting us to identify with the wagoner here, who is looking up at the bolt of lightning there, seeing his horses being frightened. And we're supposed, or at least invited, to join and feel this sense of fear and terror. We don't know for a fact that O'Connor was directly influenced by literary romanticism, but there were sometimes uncanny affinities between his paintings and contemporary poetry. For example, there's a poem by Wordsworth called The Wagoner, which was published in 1819. And there's an extract from The Wagoner which is really quite close in feeling and in content to O'Connor's The Frightened Wagoner. The rain rushed down. The road was battered as with the force of billows shattered. The horses are dismayed, nor know whether they should stand or go and Benjamin is groping near them, sees nothing and can scarcely hear them. He is astounded, wonder not, with such a charge in such a spot, astounded in the mountain gap with thunder peals, clap after clap, close treading on the silent flashes. And somewhere, as he thinks, by crashes among the rocks, with weight of rain and sullen motions long and slow, that to a dreary distance go, till, breaking in upon the dying strain, amending or his head, begin the fray again. Something which is worth pointing out about O'Connor's romantic pictures, and this work, The Frightened Wagoner in particular, is the way in which O'Connor has chosen to work with very thick, glutinous impasto paint. And compared with the very dry, precise way of handling a brush that we see in pictures like the Ballin Robe House, for example, here O'Connor seems to be painting with a much broader, freer stroke, which I suppose you could say is much more typical of the early 19th century. This invitation to identification with the Wagoner is something which didn't happen in the 18th century. 
figures in sublime landscapes in the 18th century were used to define scale and not for emotional purposes. And this stress on emotion, on involvement, is very typical of romantic painting. And is something we see in yet another of O'Connor's very finest pictures, one called The Poachers. This is one of O'Connor's most memorable pictures. It was painted in 1835, and it's an interesting mixture of Dutch-inspired realism and the kind of romanticism that we saw developed in The Frightened Wagoner. You see the poachers here caught unexpectedly by the moon breaking through the clouds there, and they're looking back over their shoulders. Maybe they heard something in the distance, a bailiff after them or something of the sort. And like the frightened wagoner, O'Connor is inviting us to partake in the feelings of these three men here. It's Dutch, though, as opposed to romantic, in the way that the horizon is very low. In, in fact, the nightscape itself, because the Dutch, Rembrandt in particular, were immensely skilled at painting pictures of this sort. And this, I think, from a technical point of view, is one of O'Connor's most impressive paintings, because it's the light and the gradation of tone that holds everything together. The romanticism which distinguishes this picture from its predecessors in 17th century Holland, let's say, lies in the way in which O'Connor stresses the relationship between the individual and the universal. In this case, the individual lies in the form of the poachers, the universal in the form of the landscape itself. And O'Connor creates a tension between these two elements by painting the poachers as being very still, caught in action, as it were, whereas the clouds centered on the moon look as though they're just about to move. So there's a sense of movement there and a stillness in the figures which creates the tension which is at the very heart of this picture. Overall, I think O'Connor's career is important, at least in one respect, in that it shows the progression of an 18th century form of landscape painting to something much more intrinsically romantic, something much more self-expressive than, than you'd find in the preceding century. In the Balin Robe series, for example, the paintings are a direct description of specific spots. In the 1820s, O'Connor begins to please other people. He creates small, pleasant, picturesque scenes for sale to the middle classes. But by the 1830s, when he became dissatisfied with the way that which his life was heading, O'Connor began to paint for himself to express his own feelings, his own reaction not alone to landscapes, but to life in general. And I think that's why paintings such as this are so powerful and still continue to appeal to us. An 18th century picture which poked bitter jibes at the artistic establishment of the day is the subject of the next program in the series. Homan Potterton talks about The Conjurer by Nathaniel Hone the Elder. <laughs>